uh, just to quickly remind you, this is something I like to do. I want to quickly remind you in a matter of five, 10 minutes, just to remind you of, of what we cover so far so we can connect to the stuff that we will cover in today's lecture. So if you remember the last class, we started a very interesting topic then, you know, and it's a different from what we have discussed in our class so far. And the name of this topic called photogrammetry and look at the name photogrammetry. So which means we will do some measurement and creating map from photos. So we take photos and then we uh, apply the magic of photogrammetry to create three dimensional models. We also looked at the different types of photogrammetry, uh, depending on where or how far I am from my object, whether it can be a close range or it can be an aerial photogrammetry, or finally it can be even satellite photogrammetry. We look at the application, like what can we use photogrammetry for? We said, okay, photogrammetry was the standard, the standard method to create a, a map on a large scale, a scale of Calgary, for example, Photogrammetry was always the way to go because simply it's very, very fast and it's very cost effective. Then in addition to uh, creating maps, we also look at stuff like, for example, architectural documentation. So if you have a building that needs to be or create a 3D model for a building, then we can certainly use photogrammetry to build our model. Anytime you say I want to create a 3D model, photogrammetry can do that for you very, very effectively. Also, the application may extend to something like forensic application or maybe a police investigation uh, for crime scene or maybe a, a traffic accident. All those can be applications for photogrammetry. It can be even extended to brain surgery, like you can take some photos, but not really with a camera, probably a different kind of camera that uh, can penetrate the skull and it can create a 3D model. Uh, so those are kind of some application that we mentioned in our class. Uh, we talked also about, you know, the good things and bad things about photogrammetry. And to be honest, most of the things are advantages rather than disadvantage. Very, very little disadvantage or limitation. Uh, one of the most important topics that we discussed in the last class is the difference between a map and a photo. You guys are very familiar with a map. Uh, I think by now a map is a piece of paper that simply contains all the features on site uh, with a scale. Uh, so we said, OK, last time we said the map is not a photo. A photo is not a map. Both of them, they are different. While map, it, ha it is simply orthogonal projection. It has only one scale and it doesn't have relief distortion or relief displacement, while an image, it's simply a perspective projection. Uh, it doesn't have a one scale, so every point on an image has its own scale, and it suffers from something called relief displacement. And this led us to another discussion about something called orthophoto, and orthophoto, it's a mix between map and photo. What does it mean if I take a photo, which we know uh, that it has a relief displacement because of the perspective projection. If I'm able to uh, restore and remove all distortion and correct my photo, then I get something called orthophoto. Remember, orthophoto it is something that you cannot get with your own camera. <clears throat> orthophoto is not natural product of the camera. If you do, if you use your camera, then what you get, you just get a normal photo that has a relief displacement. An orthophoto, it's a product of processing. So we have to use a software to simply remove all distortion and create what we call an orthophoto. Uh, we also discussed in the last class about the history of photogrammetry, and we said photogrammetry was around about 170 or 180 uh, years, which means one of the oldest surveying techniques. It is uh, older than GPS or even laser scanner or total station. It is very, very old. However, there are some significant development that happened over the last hundred years. OK, I think we mentioned three different era where we started with something called analog analog photogrammetry, analog photogrammetry, where everything there is no mathematics. There is nothing. All you have to do is you have a projector that has some lights 
and then you start doing some mechanical movement of the projector until you build your 3D model. And that went from 1900 until 1950. In 1950, things have switched and changed from analog photogrammetry into analytical photogrammetry. It means everything became equations and we have computers to solve equations together, like linear equations, and we can find all those coordinates like X, Y, Z. So that's called analytic, analytical photogrammetry. Then in the year of 2000, there is all other development that simply shifted everything from analytical photogrammetry into the era that we live right now, which is digital photogrammetry. I think everything right now is going into digital. Uh, so we have a digital camera that takes a digital image, like a computer file, and we have a computer that can read the image and can simply uh, does some processing on the image. And the whole workflow become a digital, digital workflow. What led into this business right now in the last 20 years, because we have three different reasons. Number one, we said that we have drones. So drones is one of the reason why photogrammetry came back to life. And uh, I, as I mentioned, drone is a platform that can carry your camera, provides a cheap platform because before you have to rent an aircraft, very expensive. You have to hire a pilot, very expensive. You have to buy a big camera, very expensive. And so because all those cost items, it means photogrammetry was good only for large scale, a scale of some area like the area of Calgary. Right now, because of the drone, we have a cheap platform, training is available, everything is cheaper, then we can use drones not only to survey Calgary, uh, but to survey a small scale, uh, for example, like maybe a subdivision or maybe even a single house. That's one development. The other development is uh, our computers are getting very fast, super fast, by the way. And right now you can see we have ninth, uh, like i9 computer, like processor that has nine uh, like thread or processors. Uh, we are at the 11th, 11th generation, so that's very, very fast. And why uh, we need a fast computer? Because in photogrammetry, uh, there is millions and millions and millions of calculation. So we need a faster. Otherwise, we can do the process in maybe a month or two months. Right now, because we have a, a faster machines, then we can do it maybe in a few hours. By the way, we, today we will have some little demo and you will see uh, it requires some time to build your 3D model. Okay. Now, the third one is a computer vision and artificial intelligence. So with the computer vision, the new algorithm that uh, uh, appeared uh, on the last 20 years, now we're able to make our computer smart that can read an image, go through the image and identify some features, and uh, it will do some magic with those features. Other than that, before 20, like, like uh, more than 20 years ago, everything was manually. So someone will have to sit down and look at the screen and start to pick points on the screen. And this was very, very time consuming. OK, and then finally we looked at how it works. And again, how it works is by measuring a conjugate point, like a point that shows on the left image, on the right image. And we can find the X, Y, Z in space of this point by something called forward intersection. So those lines, they are 3D lines and simply they meet at the point in space. Now the last part of the class, so this is exactly nothing, nothing in you. If everything you hear so far is something I discussed before in the last lab, and I think it took us 10 minutes, but I think that's very OK uh, because kind of I refresh your uh, your memory about what we covered last class. Now the last part I was intending to make an in class exercise. And so what happens here is um, uh, this slide is not really this year's slide. I should, probably I should have changed this slide because what happens here last year, we used a software, free software called Meshroom. And the Meshroom, uh, it's, uh, it's a software that can take your photos and create three-dimensional uh, models. We have encountered some problems last year, encountered problems with Meshroom. So what happened? The Meshroom will start and then will progress and then halfway through, like in the middle, it will stop. And uh, why it stopped is simply because there was some hardware issue. 
And some of you will say, what does it mean hardware issue? Like why a software is connected to a hardware? I will ask you one question and you will get my answer shortly. Huh? I'm asking you, anyone in this class is a gamer, like do video gaming? You guys are lying. Anybody's hiding any gamer in this class? I want to have a little discussion. I do, so, but I play on console, so I don't really understand all the computer stuff. OK, so the thing is, if you are a gamer and you're hiding right now, you will know what I mean. If you're playing video games and uh, you install the video game on a very old computer, you know what happens. huh? What happened is uh, the assembly, it will flicker like, you know, it will show you one scene and then like a kind of delay and then it will show you another scene uh, as you are running, for example. OK, why is that? Because video games are very, very, very uh, computationally intensive, so it requires a lot of calculation. This is something you enjoy, but you never feel what the computer does on the background. So the computer on the background, it's simply doing millions of calculation every single second uh, because it has to re-render the scene from where you are right now. Let's say those games that you have a gun and you're running so you can see you are running in an environment while the software, or sorry, the, the, the game will have to show you that you are running and the scene will change. This change is simply a sequence of uh, translation and rotation. So that's a lot of calculation. If the software uses uh, just like the processor, it would be very slow. And that's why every single gaming machine, it requires a different kind of video, video card. The video card, it has something called GPU, like graphic processing unit, and those are kind of multi-thread. Every thread can do calculation by its own. And this is something called the parallel processing. And what does it mean parallel processing? It means uh, some calculations Step number two requires step number one to finish first. So for example, I cannot estimate step number two without finishing number one. So in this case, you just use the processor. It's kind of sequential, I call it serial processing. So it, it calculates number one, and then it takes number one, goes to number two, and then number three. But some calculation, then you can make it barrel. It means I have 10 calculation, uh, thread number one will do the first one, thread number two will do the second one, and so on. And this will speed the results very, very quickly. And that's exactly what's happening in games. We have millions of points. We need to recalculate their position from different view, and my graphic card will simply quickly estimate this for me. Uh, Meshroom, why I'm getting into this video gaming? Because Meshroom, it does the same thing. Huh? Meshroom, it's not really a gaming mesh room has uh, one step that requires millions and millions and millions of calculation. And that's why it uses or designed to use graphic processing unit GPU. Say it, uh, laptop, they have problem with the, the, I don't think they have those graphic cards that they have a GPU. They have like kind of a cheap graphic card because it's not designed for games. And that's why uh, mesh room will simply stop in the middle. So what happens? What I did, to be honest, I was in the hunt for a, a software that gives no trouble to my student, and that's why I decided this year to go to a different software. So for whoever asked me that mesh room or I'm not going to use mesh room this year, and instead what I did is I'm going to use a software called uh, Zephyr. OK, so what I did here also, uh, if you go to your D2L, I want you guys right now to please go to your D2L. OK. I'll give you a minute. Log into your D2L, go to our course, and then go to uh, the photogrammetry module. You will see uh, something called uh, 3D Zephyr uh, tutorial. Please go ahead and download this PDF file.
So when you download the tutorial, I try to, you know, explain a little bit of what photogrammetry is to uh, just remind everyone. And then in photogrammetry, it requires a lot of calculation. We don't do that manually. There are some software and the software, uh, two things, two categories. One, it's free of a charge. And the other one is you have to pay and must have a license. So I kind of try to expose you to what do we have right now? And actually, this is just a small list. The actual list will go on and on and on. There are so many pieces of software that simply does the magic of photogrammetry. As far as I'm concerned, I'm going to focus on uh, Zephyr, which is here on the top of my list. Uh, Zephyr itself, it's not free, so you can uh, buy a, a license. Uh, so uh, the company created a free version for everyone to enjoy uh, the photogrammetry but it puts some two limitations. Number one, must be for personal use, so you're not supposed to use the software for commercial use. Number two, they are very smart. They make some limit on the number of photos to only 50. So if you have an object that can be covered by 50 photos, then in this case, use Zephyr. If you have more than 50, the software will complain and will say, okay, I will only can process only 30, uh, 50 images, and that's for the free version. For sure, the, the one that you pay, uh, there is no limit of the photos. You know what I mean? Th they are smart, okay? They want someone to try their software, but not really use it in commercial application. Because the truth is, when you try to make a map for one area, I bet you 50 is not any enough, like it's not enough. You will have to capture so many photos. There are some projects which I kind of checked. The number of photos is 40,000 image. Did you hear me right? Yes, 40,000 image. And for sure, the, 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 this uh, software, the free version, doesn't do it. So anyway, so how can we use the software without any trouble? Because it's easy software, uh, it's, uh, it's free. So what I did is I gave you some data set, which we'll go through uh, shortly. Uh, but please, if your data set is less than 50, great. If data set is more than 50, we only have to choose only 50 photos. That's it. On the other hand, we have here, we have a software that is uh, you have to pay. On the top of the list, there is something called Bix4D. Bix4D is the pioneer. It's kind of big monster. It kind of dominates the market. And um, anyone uh, is using photogrammetry, probably they use Bix4D. There are some other competitors, which is cap it's something called Capturing Reality and something called Agisoft Metashape and also 3D Zyf, uh, 3DF uh, Zephyr. Those are software that you have to pay for it. And I make here a table that shows you, if you are interested, you can take a look of, uh, of their website. Now, please, right now, uh, you, you need to go to uh, either to your D2L. So on the D2L, under the same folder, you will find our data set. So the data set here is simply uh, those photos that you can see on my screen. OK, I'll just open one for them, one uh, for the moment. Huh? Anybody have seen this picture before? It's not in my house. That's in public place in Calgary. Anybody have seen this or came across this thing uh, in Calgary? It's, uh, it's not easy, I know, especially in pandemic. So this uh, this wooden mask here, it's uh, it's in Devonian Garden, uh, and Devonian Garden is in downtown downtown Calgary in TD Square, uh, fourth floor. Uh, so right now, I need to ask you to please, all of you, go to your D2L and download this data set uh, from D2L. It's available under the same uh, photogrammetry module called Devonian Garden wooden mask, and it's a zip file. So when you download, you have to decompress uh, your file to get those 47 image. Please do it right now. I will give you two minutes.
OK, so the, we have more like I didn't want to, to load all my data sets to the D2L. That's too much uh, like uh, data. So what I did is I have more data sets which is available on the O drive. I will just navigate myself to where I placed all data sets and I will simply paste the, uh, the link into the chat site. Uh, so um, here we go. We're very close. You don't have to worry about what I'm doing. I will be sending you uh, the link. So here we go. Here is the link. I will paste the link into the chat site. So here is the link. So if you are interested, you can simply uh, navigate to this data link here. So you will see so many data sets. OK, so for example, on this uh, location on the O drive, there is uh, some uh, data set for monument, uh, for lion, sleeping lion, for a doll, uh, for Devonian garden, for building two buildings, and finally for accident. OK, that's if you are interested and I can encourage you. If you have something also at home, let's say you have a vase or any object at home where it can be covered by 50 photos, you can use your cell phone and simply take those photos and yeah. I'll give you some tips on how to take these photos. OK. Now uh, also what I want everyone to do for now is to download the free version of the Zephyr. OK, so all you have to do is you go to my tutorial and uh, on my tutorial you can see the green line and simply click on this link here. It will take you to uh, the the free version of the Zephyr software. Please show your hands if you already have done this, because that's something I asked you to do in the last class. If you have done so, please show your hands. Three, four, five, six, eight. OK, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now what I will do is I will simply uh, start the software and I will show you how do we use the software which is a very, very simple process. It is kind of almost automatic. You will see uh, the intervention of the user in, in those software. It's kind of very minimum because as I said, the software is very smart. It will do the entire job on your behalf. Please watch me. So what I will do right now is I will simply start my software. Uh, I'm going to search for uh, Zapier and um, I'm sorry, that's Arabic, so not Arabic. I don't need to use to Arabic. And then uh, Zephyr. And then here is my software. And when you start the software, it will just show you if you want to look at some tutorial. Uh, the company, the, it has a very extensive website that gives you videos on how to run the software. Again, you're free to watch them if you have time. I gave you an alternative where it shows you in a PDF file. So I'm going to say, you know what? Not for now. I'm OK. I know how to do that. And here we go. You can see here you get this interface where your final results will show this in in this uh, 3D view here. And you can see you can rotate and you can shift things left and right, up and down and simply rotate by mouse clicks. First thing you want to do is after you start the software is you go from menu uh, workflow. And then uh, next day, as you say, new project, new project. And the good news is once you do that, once you go from menu workflow and then new project, it will take you through a wizard like steps like, you know, one, two, three. So you don't have to miss any of the intermediate steps because it's a wizard. OK, let's look at this. So your first thing that you want to uh, do is number one, you have to tell the software what are you trying to do? Uh, number one, please make sure that you check this box here, which means compute a 3D model after project creation. So that's your intention. Number two, your 3D model, you need a texture. It means you need to be color. So also check this box here. So the, what you can do is on this page is check those boxes. It means I need 3D model and also I need my 3D model to be colored. Because you remember uh, in photogrammetry, one of the big advantage of photogrammetry, uh, unlike any other technique, it's not only giving you X, Y, Z, but also gives you X, Y, Z plus the color of this point on site because this X, Y, Z came from a photo. OK, so we need a textured model. Number two, after you finish this setup here, you just have to go and say next. 
So very simple. I need a 3D. I need my 3D be, to be textured. Next. So once you go and say next, it takes you to the next step. And this is simply a photo selection page. You can read the title here on the top. Photo selection page. It means where are your photos? So here we go. We have here a few options. Number one is you can select the images or you can select a folder. Which one you think will work? I'll tell you the secret. Huh? If you know that your folder has less than 50 image, then all you have to do is select the, fo the folder and the software will read all the images stored in this folder. If your folder has more than 50 image, what do you think? If your folder has more than 50 image, if you select the folder, so all the images will be read, but the software will complain. Why it complains? Because there is a limit on the free version of maximum of 50 photos. So watch me, I will say, OK, you know what? I'm going to go by folder because why is that? Because my Devonian garden, my Devonian garden wooden mask, I know that I have less than 50 photos, so it should be OK. So once you say select folder, you can see here, I go to where my folder is. I click on the folder and I say select the folder. What happened is the software will simply read all the photos or the images inside this folder. Or you can see a list of all those photos here. OK, you can see I highlighted them. Those yellow are the uh, different uh, photos for the mask. Uh, by the way, if you even by mistake added a folder and happens to be more than 50, more than 50 photos, and if you click next, software will say, no, no, I can't. I'm designed to do maximum of 50. Here is one button, and this button here, if you mark one photo, you can simply click on this button here, and simply this will delete. So you can keep deleting until you go to the 50 photos, which the software allows you to do that. OK, next is. Before I hit next, I want to mention something that the software also has two options. Uh, you can import your uh, your pictures from a video. What does this mean? It means you can with your camera and instead of you capturing a, 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 a photo at different location, you can take a video and the video is nothing more than uh, simply so many photos stitch it together. So let's say so many photos. Right now, some cameras, they capture the, the video on a very high rate. For example, 60 frame per second. You will hear this name, huh? FPS, 60 frame per second. It means every second of the video, it has 60 frames, 60 photos. Now, uh, to be honest, this is not really uh, what I want to do. Uh, I'm just going to go, gonna warn you. Taking uh, vid uh, photos from video, it's kind of tricky. Why it's tricky? Because simply those images are very close. Like remember, let's say you're holding a camera and you're moving your camera while taking a video. So imagine huh? in one second you're taking 60 photos in one second, which means if you simply uh, take photos which is, they are very, very close in terms of time, this is not really good for photogrammetry because a photogrammetry requires more than one photo and there must be a spacing in between them. So you must move from one location to another location. So you have a base of photography. Anyway, in this exercise, I will just use still images taken by a camera, uh, not a video. Next is you say next. And once you say next, in this step, the software read all the images. And I want to take some time to show you what the software has came up with. You can see, for example, this is image, uh, image, uh, you know, dot JBG, and that's one format. And look at this. Right now, the software read the image and tells you that adjusted SM, uh, SMG935W8, and then dash four millimeter, and then four zero two two times three zero two four, and then BEX. I want to tell you what does this mean. Simply, this means that's the camera model is a GM. That's the camera model GM, uh, sorry, SMG9. And that's the, my cell phone camera, by the way, uh, in Samsung S7. And the four millimeter, it's the focal length. And then finally, those two numbers are the size of your image. 
your image is 4032 pixel by uh, 3024 pixels. Remember that the image is like a matrix. The image is like a matrix. Did you guys learn anything about matrix in your uh, math classes? I know you did. You guys are very quiet, but I know. Don't lie to me because I know that you did. Uh, you study matrix or matrices in some of your classes. And what is matrix? Matrix is very simple. It is like this thing on the on the back. Huh? This thing on the back is a matrix. It's just an organization of numbers in terms of columns and terms of rows. So we have columns and rows and we have numbers. What are those numbers? Those are the brightness number of your objects. So whenever you record your image, there is a CCD array, like a matrix of small element. And when the light hits this object or this uh, CCD array, it records the brightness number, like how much light fall into it. OK, now what happens here is that there are some other parameters of the camera, not only the focal length or maybe the, the, uh, the size of the, of the sensor, but there are some other calibration parameters. And watch this. So I'm going to open this window here which you don't have to do that. So when you look at this set of parameters, some is called radial distortion and some is called tangential distortion. So those are calibration parameter. Every lens, if you study some like in your physics classes, anything about lens, uh, when a line of sight passes through the lens, it simply distorts the line of sight. It doesn't really go ideally as a line. It simply go off this line. OK, and that's why there are some distortion. You know what? You don't have to worry about them because the software during the estimation, it will calibrate your camera. It will calibrate your camera. Next is I'm done. I, I imported my images, so let's go ahead and hit next. So the next part is very easy because simply you don't have to do anything. You just have to go next, next, next. Why is that? Because the process will require many parameters. And if you drop this menu, you can see you can see there are some called presets and there are some called advanced. And what does it mean? Look at this place. I'm going to go to advanced. And one, once you click on advanced, it gives you a control over changing, changing some of the parameters or the processing algorithm. OK. What happens here is that the software comes with a preset. It means there are some default values. So if you are using the preset, you're good to go. You just have to say hit next and next and so on. OK, however, for advanced user, if you are advanced user, let's say you have a uh, you study photogrammetry and you know all what is going on in, in a depth de details. So you know what does those numbers or those options mean? Then the software allows you to play with them. In general, for you guys, you are guys are so beginner. Huh? You're just kind of playing with photogrammetry and which is great. Actually, you're playing with photogrammetry. But you don't know the, exactly what's going on during the processing. And don't feel bad about it because if you want to know all these details, you need a degree, a degree in photogrammetry. It means you need four years to know every single terminology of what you see on the screen. You don't have to worry about it. I can give you kind of a, a kind of a, a hint of what those are. Look at this, please. I'll just maybe mention only one of them. OK, so when it comes to key key point density, like uh, you will see, and I'm discussing this later on, some called the key point. In order for the software to build a 3D model, the computer will have to look at individual image and simply pick some points. And those points, uh, we call them key points. Look at this. So how? what are my options here? I can use low, very low, or I can say low or medium or high or very high. What are the consequences of this choice? It is simply the processing time. If I ask the software to find for me so many points in the image, then for sure it will take more time. If I ask for very low, it means I get uh, I need less time. But I'm asking you which one is better if you just forget about the time, which one to find more points or less points? More points. More points. And you can see right now I'm just trading off. Huh? I'm going in the middle, so I'm asking for medium. It means don't go too high or too low, and I will get medium time. 
hopefully you guys get what do I mean here. What I'm saying here is that you can go for the presets. It means the software has some presets, va uh, parameters, values of the parameters. So it will work for you as a beginner. But if you are advanced user and you know what those means, you can go to advanced and you can change your uh, your parameters according to your requirement. You know what? I'll make it simple. I'll go to presets and what I will do next is I will just accept all the presets. It means whatever you think is good for me, please do it. Huh? Now, once you go to the last step, which is here, look at this right now. The software already we are at the end of the wizard software figure out. I have 43 image and it just kind of summarizes here for you all the uh, the steps. Now you look at next. If you click next, it's great already. There is no next. So what do you think? What should I do right now? Can you see anything on my screen to start the processing? Run. 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 So you can see I'm going to hit run. And the surprise is that's really all I need to do to get my 3D model. So adding your images uh, or adding the folder, uh, do some setup. And then finally, if you are ready, then you hit run. And please watch my screen as I hit run. So right now the software will spend some time without any human interaction. The software is able to read the photos, figure out uh, those features on the photos and do the magic and find for me the 3D model. You know what? This process will not take like a second. It will take a few minutes. And remember, I'm not really going on the highest resolution. I'm using a medium resolution. OK, so I will just leave it to work and then I'll come back here when I have the results. So all you have to do right now is click on minimize. So you click on minimize. Because I want to discuss with you some other things uh, until the software finish so I can show you the final results. So let's minimize. You can see here right now minimizing everything. Now what I want you to look at is uh, my tutorial. So I'm going to switch back to my tutorial and because I know I know whatever I say, some of you are curious will say, OK, how come when you see the final results? How come? How could the software uh, uh, be able to create a 3D model from two dimensional images. And that's why for this curiosity, what I will do is I will take you to where in my tutorial I mentioned that. Again, in this description here, you see some snapshots where it shows you exactly what I said a minute ago. Uh, you can enjoy reading on your leisure time, leisure time, but uh, uh, here we go. Here is our 11 uh, uh, steps. OK, so I'm going to stop here. And what you see here, and I'm sorry, what you see here is uh, uh, in uh, four, 11 steps. The software, and to be honest, that's any photogrammetric software will do that. We'll start from step number one, and in step number 11, you get your 3D uh, textured model. I will try to explain on a very, very high level what those steps are. Again, if you are curious, please. Follow me if you're not curious of why photogrammetry or how photogrammetry does the magic and creativity model. Just enjoy your time. Now I'm going to show you right now step number one, which you already have seen it, which is here called the camera initialization. It means I will need to read all the photos. And by the way, that's a lot of data. We have a 43 image and every image is let's say four or five megabytes. So I need to read all the images. It means I will read the colors, the colors of every pixel in my image. After you read your image, number two, something called feature extraction. Now I'm going to talk about features on example here. OK, so let's go to this image and probably this image is not really a good view. Let's look at. Uh, another image, which is let's say. Probably this one, so let's say this one. So I want everyone to focus here and look at this image. Now I'm asking you here. Uh, you can see the white background. You can see the wooden mask is hanging on a kind of a board, a white board. And this white board simply it's just white. There is no feature that you can look at. But I'm asking you, for example, look at this point here, which simply the tip of the eye like this point here. This is distinct point. 
that the software can figure out or can find. Typically, those points are when there is a change of the color or a change of the direction of the, of the surface. Look at the crack. So the crack here is a feature. Uh, again, all I'm asking you right now is to compare between this white board in the background where there is no feature, where there is no, no feature, and the face where there are a lot of features. Now, I know some of you still now, until now will say, OK, I, I, I still I don't know what's what do you mean by feature. OK, so let me do this. So I'm showing I'm going to show you here right now the two photos. Probably I need to space them, so I leave this one. I will take this. Let's say this one. OK, and I'll put them side by side. So I have two photos. I will bid, I'll put them side by side. OK, I want to show you what does it mean by feature. Now let me ask you, can you see where is my cursor? Just please see my cursor. Can you tell me where this point where my cursor is on the right image? Can you tell me where exactly this point on the right on the left image? Can anybody do that? Yes or no? If you cannot say I can't. No, sorry, I can't. No, we can't. No, you can't. But I mean, I'll do the exercise one more time. Can you, if I zoom in here on this image and I, I go to this point here, uh, this point here, can you do the same thing on this uh, on this uh, left image? Can we do the uh, correspondence between this point on the left image and the right image? Please, I need uh, yes or no. Yeah. Can you do that? Yes. Yes, you can. And remember, when you can, the software can, the computer can. When you cannot, so the software cannot. And that's why when it comes to those interest point, simply the software will find many of them on the mask, but almost none none on this wooden uh, on on the on the board okay and that's the first step so the separate step is the software will simply try to extract those features from your image number three the software based on this feature will try to know the sequence like image one is connected to image two so there is an overlap between image one and two and between image two and image 20 so it will do something called image matching it will tell this image is matching. There is an overlap between image one and image four and between image four and image 20 and so on. The next one is matching and we already discussed the matching. Matching, it means the software will go back to our example and will say, OK, you know what? This point here corresponds to this point here and this point here on the uh, uh, other eye corner corresponds to this point here. And this point on the crack here corresponds to the other point on the crack here. I'm asking you for human. Is that easy or difficult? If I give you a cursor and I tell you big for me a point on the right image and the same the conjugate point on the left image. Is that easy or difficult for a human? Difficult. Really? So I, if I give you this image, so and I tell you, for example, I give you this point on the teeth. You cannot tell that this point is this point here on the teeth. Oh, no, that's easy. That's super easy. Huh? Even for a small kid, by the way, can do that. However, I know that some of you will think that's trivial, huh? but the, 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 the surprise is this process. It takes a uh, it's very difficult for the computer to do. And I can, for example, illustrate on why look at the teeth. So the teeth, this teeth is very close to this teeth, so you can mismatch. For example, this point here looks pretty much like this point here, while it's not the same point, very much like it, right? So anyway, so this was a long debate for how many years uh, ever since photogrammetry started and uh, mathematicians and uh, researchers, they try to solve this puzzle. How can we match? How the software can look at one image and search on the other image to find the match? I can tell you something. Uh, we are, there are some research and it is not robust. It means sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work until year of 1999. 1999. So this is the year and I am personally br very proud because simply this whole uh, development is uh, attributed to the paper you see on my screen. So on the screen here, it's a paper published by a UBC professor called David Lowe. OK, so he published a, a, a paper in 1999, which is about to solve this puzzle. 
So he came up with algorithm that can simply do the matching very, very, very robust. Again, I don't, you don't have to read anything of this paper here. I'm trying to show you what happens, the development. So from the 1950s to the year 2000, 50 years of research, people they tried to came up with algorithm uh, as as for uh, to simply do the matching process, which again for the human is kind of a trivial process. However, for machines, for computer, it's kind of very difficult to run because there will be lots, lots of mismatch. When I mean mismatch, it means maybe uh, the software will pick this point on the right image, when on the left image it will mismatch and pick this point, and this is not really good. In, uh, in 1999, Dr. Lowy, he came up with this paper, which simply changes the entire era of photogrammetry, because right now we can do that very, very robust. We can say this point, not we, the software or the algorithm can tell me this point is the match of this point here. And by the way, that's all you need to do the photogrammetry to find the match. How about before 1950s? How the process was being done? Manually. So someone will have to sit down and click here and click there, click here and click there, click here and click there until you do all the match. And that's what creates your 3D model. And this is very, very time consuming process. Now I think by now, uh, let's look at the second step. So after after you create, uh, you get the match, uh, you do the image matching, uh, you estimate the location of your camera and even the 3D model. So in the step number five called structure from motion, which means you're able to create your 3D model by taking several uh, photos from different, by moving your camera. Uh, so what happens here, I'm going to show you on uh, some like more idea on this, this step on the software, but this is called structure from motion. It means I'm going to uh, uh, find what is my 3D model and find where my camera was and also what was the orientation of my camera when I took my photos. Then it followed by several steps and I don't want to go through those steps. I'm going to go on high level. So we this step here will give you kind of course results, like maybe a hundred point, maybe a thousand point, but that's not sufficient to represent the surface. The surface will be so coarse, okay? And so the software from this point on will try to densify. It means find more points and more points and more points on the surface, and then uh, again this process will have a, some sort of noise, and I will show you what noise means on the model. Uh, but there will be some filtering. Filtering, it means get rid of the noise. Get me, get rid of all the errors. And then from this point, uh, uh, cloud, we create a mesh. And this discussion here, going from a point cloud into a mesh, pretty much like what we've done in Civil 3D. If you guys remember, when I imported points into Civil 3D, they came as points. When I create a surface, now I have a continuous representation of my 3D model. So the software from the point cloud will create a mesh and then finally will texture the mesh. It means it will color the mesh by the colors from the photos. Uh, let's see if the process software is finished. So let's see. I think the software is finished. You can see all the photos. Uh, you can see yes, 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 yes. It means all the photos, they have been reconstructed. It means I know where was the photos and also what was the orientation of every photo. Just finish, and here we go. We have our results. Watch this. I want some one of you guys to confirm for me. This product here is the same as this thing here. What is the difference between this thing in this model, which I'm rotating in 3D, and those thing here in this banner? Anybody tell me the difference? 2D to 3D. Exactly. So those where I started and at the bottom here, there are two dimensional photos, many of them. And here I don't have those I'm, with the magic of photogrammetry. I'm able to create my 3D model. Now, when I said the structure from motion, remember, I'm going to reflect on some stuff which I mentioned here briefly. So I'll try to show you more, de more details. So when I say structure from motion, I'm asking you, do you see those bl blue uh, blue dots or blue pyramids. Can anybody guess for me what are those blue pyramids? Where the camera was taken. Exactly. Where the so 
those are exactly where the cameras were taking. And from the algorithm, they can find where was my camera. Can anybody tell me what Tahir did to capture this just by looking at those blue? Uh, that 47 photograph. We have 47 photographs, but I'm asking you, do you know what is the pattern that I hold my camera and I went? I'm going to tell you, OK, so what happens here? You can see there is a row or kind of arc around the, the face uh, from left. So I went here from left. I took one image. I moved one image. I moved on this high level until I finish. I go to the other side. Then I lower my camera. I went to another arc and then finally I lower my camera. I went to the last arc. I'm trying to cover the entire face with some overlapping photos. Can anybody tell me why my images will have to be overlapping? Overlapping, it means same area will have to show in one more than one image. Anybody attended last class and understand? So, so it can see like the same point on the same image and get depth. Uh, you can see the same point on different image. That's what you're right. saying. Yeah. Yes, right. OK, right. which means which means remember without this, you cannot build a 3D model. The rule is you your 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 point must show in at least two photos, just like your eye. If we see in more than two photos, that's great, that's better. But the minimum is two. One is not enough. And that's why I'm trying to take some overlapping photos to create my 3D model. Now I have also more discussion with you guys. L lots of interesting discussion. OK, now. Maybe this angle, you don't see the problem, OK? I'm going to rotate a little bit, OK? I'm going to rotate a bit. Anybody see a problem? There wasn't it enough like, information. <laughs> Excuse me, can you please go in order? Like, I need one at a time. Show your hands, please, if you want to say something. OK, Ryan, what's the problem you see on my model? Uh, the background molded into the face. There wasn't enough data points on that. Uh, spot. OK, so the problem is right. So you write like the background, the whiteboard. It doesn't seem like it's flat. Like the reality, it's flat. But when you look from this angle here, there is lots of noise. There is up and down. And why this? Why this is happening? Because here is the thing. Photogrammetry is not a friend with flat uh, flat surface uh, that they have the same color because there is no feature point here. There is no interest point because simply as I told you before, if I pick one point on the on the board on the right image, it is impossible for you to find the same point on the right left image because simply there is no feature and because there is no feature you you fail photogrammetry also fails. So photogrammetry is not friend with uh, featureless surfaces. Now I'm asking you, can we do photogrammetry when my ground is covered with the snow? Think about the same idea. I have like, let's say in winter, I fly my drone and the entire ground is covered with the snow. Do you think I will get good results or bad results? Bad results. Bad results. OK, so you know, huh? so photogrammetry is not friend with shiny, with shiny, featureless surface. There must be a feature so the software can detect and build a 3D model. So that's one discussion I want everyone to know and be clear about it. So why the photogrammetry? I'm asking you, how about the face? Is it good model or bad model? What do you think? What do you feel? Good model or bad model? Good. Yeah, why it's good? Why why photogrammetry works amazing on the on this mask here? Because you can see the mask has lots of feature. All of those small uh, dings in the face, this is a feature where the software can find this point here and go to the other image and find the conjugate or the correspondence between this point and the other points. OK, so photogrammetry, we have features, works great. Flat, uh, you know, shiny, featureless, it doesn't work. It gives you noise, as you can see here from this picture. OK, now. I guess at this moment of time, I want to uh, because we're wrapping things up. I would not want to spend more time on the software before we uh, give you a break. I want to show to show you something. Let's look at the bottom at the, at the left side. So the left side here is your products. 
Right now, I'm showing only the final one. Can please anyone confirm for me and read the name? What is the final product of photogrammetry? Look at my cursor, please. Can you please read? Um, a textured mesh. Exactly. And look at my tutorial. I said here the software will go and do 11 steps. What is your final product? It's called texturing. So it colors your 3D model. But the question is, what are the previous step? So I'm going to show you right now. So let's turn off the final results. You can see uh, my screen is empty. And I can also, if you wish, you can turn off the cameras. You can see, you can go, but it takes more time because those are 40, uh, 47 images. So you can turn off all of them. Uh, like so, if you wish, but that's not required. Huh? So let's uh, let's show. Sorry. Let's go to the next step and simply let's show what does it mean? Sparse point cloud. Let's click on it. And that's by the way, that is your structure from motion result. It creates for you a very low density point or surface. Watch this. OK, so here we go. You can see this is the result from your step number. Uh, step number five, structure from motion. Step number five, you can see, can you identify that this is really a mask? Those are not many points, there are few points, and give you a minimum representation of the surface. Okay, minimum representation of the surface. Now, what happened next is, if I go to the next, uh, next product, which is called dense, dense point cloud. Let's go ahead and turn on dense point cloud. And you can see now I'll zoom out. OK, I'm asking you. What do we call this product here? There are many, many, many points and that's called dense point cloud. Look at the name dense, huh? So the software did some magic to generate more points on the surface. OK, and uh, but the point is this is point cloud. It means we have millions and millions of points or maybe let's say 100,000 points called the point cloud. But you can see the points are not connected to each other. The points, it's not a surface anymore. It's not yet. Those are the scree points. Let me show you the next step. So let's minimize this and let's go to the mesh. If you turn on the mesh, now you can see this is not point cloud anymore. This is not point cloud anymore. So the software connected the points and by a mesh or a surface. So you can see we have different terminology. So this is the same as civil 3D surface or 10. So it connects the points together in some in some continuous surface. And then finally you have your final textured final textured uh, uh, pro uh, product. OK. So one thing I want to mention which should be very clear uh, should be very important. Now, this uh, model here, it's a 3D model. Do you agree or disagree? Do you agree this is 3D? Yes, 3D. OK, so the, here is the, 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 the surprise for you. This is 3D, which is fantastic for sure, but there is a little problem here. This model here, it doesn't have a right scale. And I know some of you will say, Tahir, what do you mean right scale? Watch me, please. So on the software, there are some tools here allowing you to take some measurement. OK, so you can see here you just have to go to the toolbar, click on it. And you get the sounds called quick measurement. You say begin and it allows you to go and click here and then click here. OK, so when you click on two points, what the software does, it simply measure the distance. Can anybody tell me how much is the distance? Fourteen point two nine. Thank you so much. But the question is for you. I'm asking you: Is that inch, or millimeter, or meter, or kilometer? What are the units? Any help? Probably, you know what? Probably to, to, to give you like to give you a, a, a like a, 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 a what what do I mean? OK, probably I'll go here and I will probably I have some picture kind of will give you kind of a scale, huh? a scale. 
So if you just look at any of these, uh, any of these images, you guys know that this is a blocker. Those are called CMU blocks, and I'm pretty sure in CVT you'd know what does those mean. Huh? On the background, there is a CVT, uh, um, uh, a concrete masonry block, CMU. You guys see that? Hello. Yes. So, uh, OK, so you guys roughly, I'm not going to ask you for a exact number. I'm not doing this. I'm asking you, let's say CMU is, let's say, uh, eight inch height, eight inch high. Can you tell me roughly what is the size of the board? All you have to do is just count. I count one, two, three, four, and probably five. So I can tell you probably this board is one meter by one meter. One meter by one meter. Are you guys following the discussion? I'm trying to show you. Uh, roughly, roughly, what is the size of this object? OK, so if this one CMU block is eight inches, like 200 millimeter, so we have one, two, three and four and then half and half. Let's say we end up with one meter. Are you guys following? Do you agree? Yes, I agree. OK, look at this. So let's go to the software. So if you're telling me right now that that the, the distance is one meter, while the software is saying 14 point something. What does it mean? Although I have a good 3D model, huh? look at this. This is a really good 3D model. So what does it mean? It means something. It means the scale of this model is not right. Would you agree? Yes. OK, and you know what? This is not really a big deal, to be honest. Not big deal. Can anybody suggest for me a solution for that? What if I want to get a good measurement? What do I need to do? Anybody who is good at math and and tell me what to do. So now I measured here a uh, software telling me 14.2 and we know that this is roughly one meter. Anybody to tell me how can I, can I correct this problem? How can I correct this problem? Calibrate it somehow. Scale it, huh? scale it. Is that what you mean? So that's true, by the way. So really to fix this problem, you all need to scale your scale your model. And if I am in Devonian Garden right now, I will get my measure tape. I will measure this board. Let's say this board is uh, is let's say one meter. If you divide your one meter by the 14.298, uh, you will get the scale and you can simply scale up or down this model. Hopefully everyone is following. Now this this is really uh, not really uh, bad. We can do that for sure. We can do some length measurement and it requires only one length. If I measure this length, that's the minimum to simply scale up or scale down your model. Now, uh, listen, some of you I know by now it's OK. Tahir, are we really in surveying class? Are we in surveying class? Because some of you, I took you a different way. We're building a 3D model like a graphical class. But remember, at the end of the day, we're not really creating map for faces or for maybe a statue or maybe for a monument. We do, we're not doing this. So what are we doing in surveying class? We're creating maps for the ground, for roads and building. So I'm asking you, would we in, in, in surveying, would we measure distance? I know this is not really easy discussion, so in surveying we don't measure distance, we simply measure uh, coordinates. We have control point. So if I add here one control point, let's say total station will measure for me a control point here and a control point here. I'm asking you, my problem solved or not solved? If I know the XYZ here and the XYZ here using total station, problem solved or not solved? Solved. Thank you so much. And so we get to the final answer here. So photogrammetry, it gives you a 3D model, a 3D model. Uh, but it lacks the scale, which is easy fix. So you can measure a distance on the object and you can scale your model up or down In surveying. What we do is we don't measure distances. We simply measure coordinates, measure coordinates. OK, so really, I think that's what I wanted to say. Uh, the software has more features, but I'm going to leave this up to uh, your curiosity. Uh, you can, for example, uh, 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 make animation. I can here go to the right side. I can add all current, uh, current, uh, add all camera location, and I can simply click on this uh, animation button and simply what it does, it simply animates your 3D model going from one camera location 
to another camera location and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's something in the software. Also, the software allows you to simply uh, select some of those uh, surfaces and delete because look at this at the edge. I'm asking you, do you see any noise, any error here on the edge? Do you see any error on the edge? Is that really my CMU is doing like this? There are errors. There are some errors. So anyway, so I'm going to leave it this up to you guys, uh, which is not very difficult. The software allows you to scale. So you can see here if I go to this button here, it allows me to scale my uh, my object up and down. Uh, and also it allows me to delete some of those triangles if you want. OK, again, I bet you that there are lots of uh, Zephyr tutorial. If you are interested, if you are not interested and you just want to learn what I teach you in my class, that is OK by me. Now, uh, before I give you a break now, what do you think? What is the next step? Here is my 3D model. What can I do with this model? So you need to, uh, to export this your model into another format, which you can do something with it. So here we go. If you go to menu export, uh, software allows you to export in some format. One of them is a PDF, so you can simply create a, a PDF uh, for this scene here from this angle. Or what you can do is you can go to export texture, and simply the software allows you to export your file into several formats. Let's drop this menu. I need some help to read for me those uh, names. Those are the different formats that you can write your 3D model. Uh, looks like we have PLY and we have uh, OBJ. Anybody who is into 3D printing? Anybody in the class who is into 3D printing? So if you are into 3D printing or you have a 3D printer at home, you will see if you export your file into BLY or object, those are very popular very popular uh, 3D format. You can simply slice this uh, file and carry and simply print it on a 3D printer. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, something also probably on the tutorial, you will see it on the very last page. I showed you uh, what you can do with the file. Uh, there are some uh, uh, free services on the Internet where you can host this model. You can simply export this model and you can upload it to the Internet. So there is many of them, not only one. And uh, the one I want to talk about is called Sketchfab. If you click on Sketchfab, it's simply a website that allows you to host your model. And in general, uh, uh, Sketchfab is not free. You have to pay a subscription unless you agree to these conditions. OK, so if you look at uh, my tutorial, you will see there are two conditions. Number one, your file or your uh, your exported file should not exceed more than 50 megabytes. So that's the maximum. And number two, you must make your model public. If you agree to these conditions, then you can host your model into Sketchfab for free. I'm not sure if that's enough information for you for the software. Uh, we will have uh, 10 minutes a break, and after the break, we'll come back for more discussion on photogrammetry. OK, any question for now before we break? I'm sorry if I went too long. I know I went for one hour, 50, one hour, 10 minutes. But again, I don't want to cut my tutorial in the middle. Any question before we break? OK, so I will break and I will see you guys in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 